Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of MoCo's Most Famous, where we talk to notable people from Montgomery County, Maryland. I'm Joe Yasharoff, the Director of Content at Montgomery Community Media and your host. Today, we're talking to someone who burst into the national spotlight on the hit ABC show, The Golden Bachelor. Joan Vassos was one of the contestants on the show, made a big splash early on, then decided to leave suddenly because of a family matter. She works at Landon School in Bethesda, and she's joining us today to talk about her journey. Joan, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you for having me. I am great. Excited to finally be here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in a nutshell, or maybe not in a nutshell, describe how your life has changed in the last few months. Gosh, it would be hard to put that in a nutshell like you like you alluded to. Um, so the, we did all the filming in August, like, uh, like you said, I came home pretty early, but your journey kind of doesn't stop there because as they tell you, when you join the bachelor nation, once you're part of it, you're always a part of it and they bring you back for special occasions. So after, um, being on the show, doing the filming, the small part that I did, um, in addition to going to watch parties here with my friends and having a great time on Thursday nights, um, I got brought back a couple of times to LA. So I was back for um, the Women Tell All episode. And then I just recently got back, in fact, uh, two days ago from LA, I was there for After the Final Rose, which was when Gary and Teresa's uh, made the announcement that they were getting married. Yes, and Gary's obviously the Golden Bachelor and Teresa's the one that, who won. Uh, for those, for the the two people out there who who don't know what we're talking about, who don't watch The Golden Bachelor, very few who don't. Um, so let's go back a little bit. Um, so have you, uh, were you a fan of The Bachelor franchise uh, for years and The Bachelorette? Were you watching like uh, so many others? Yeah, well, so I, I watch sporadically. I always like it, but it's awfully hard to like commit to every Thursday night when sure. you have a big family like I do and, you know, grandchildren and things happening. And I also had a very sick husband for many years. And so, um, you know, I, I, I was a faithful watcher as much as I could be. I was certainly watched a lot in the beginning episodes. So I certainly saw um, like the, you know, the original, the OG uh, Golden Bachelor or Bachelor, Bachelorette actually. Um, and then I watched sporadically throughout the year but um, always had an interest in it because I thought it was a very interesting concept. And the fact that the first one worked so well and they are still married um, and that, you know, there have been some success stories over the years. And then there's also like the fun drama that it's fun to watch. Um, and then they, you know, spun off to Bachelor in Paradise. I watched that also. So, you know, they've done enough iterations that it kept my interest and, you um, there's been enough kind of characters on the show that make you want to keep coming back because you don't want to miss something, you know, when you're at work and everybody's talking about what happened the night before you want to, you don't want to be left out. So I kind of have been a pretty faithful watcher over the years. Definitely good uh, water cooler fodder for, uh, yes. for folks. Um, so now the show, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's, it's for is 20, 20 year olds, 30 year olds, you know, uh, falling in love and, and finding their match. And then someone who said, you know what? people can still fall in love when they're 50, 60, 70 years old. So take us through, I know you weren't part of the process of creating the show, but uh, from what you've learned, um, how did that come into being? Somebody saying, let's let's do the Golden Bachelor. Yeah, so I think it came into being, <clears throat> from what I understand, I was not part of it because I just turned 60 in January. So it's, I'm, I'm almost 61 now, but um, you had to be 60 to apply. So mm -hmm. if if they were making doing advertisements for it, I wasn't listening. But from what I understand, about three years ago, they started doing casting calls for this. And then COVID hit and they stopped everything and they didn't resume those until, you know, 2023. Um, but in the meantime, I think that they recognize that there was this huge population of people that I honestly, I think have a harder time finding love than the 20 and 30 year olds. And I kind of made this, I kind of had this thought when I was out to dinner one evening and it had been about two years since my husband had passed away. And I was out to dinner with a friend and we were sitting at the bar having dinner. And I looked around and I said, look at this restaurant. I go, everybody here is a couple. I said, it's going to be so hard to meet somebody organically. And it was just kind of entering my mind that I wanted to do that, that it was like something that I wanted back in my life that, um, you know, I loved being married and I wanted, and you knew my husband, Joe. So um, I, you know, he was a character and he, you know, we had a very happy life together. And like the thought was that, you know, I would never replace him, but I could still be happy with somebody. And I wanted to do that. 
And the other thing I thought is, even if I saw a single person or somebody that appeared to be this restaurant, I would assume that they were married because everybody's in their 60s and 70s married. This is a world of couples. And I thought my son, who is 27, has a completely different experience. So when he goes out with his friends and um, he's at a bar or a restaurant, he probably assumes everybody his age is single. And so it's a very different experience. So I think Bachelor um, Nation realized that, that it's easy for 20s and 30 year olds to find. And they have a lot of people applying for that because there's tons of them out there. But the 60s and 70s, we have a much harder time because everybody in our life is couples already. And um, it's hard to find somebody organically. In fact, it's almost impossible. If you don't go on a dating app, chances are I will never find somebody. Or if I don't do something drastic like The Golden Bachelor. So that's how I ended up coming to be on The Golden Bachelor. And I think that's how the whole thought of it. I mean, it was certainly very intuitive of somebody at Bachelor Nation that this was a group of people that maybe needed some help. Were there any misgivings to to kind of doing this publicly in the event? And of course you did in the event that you became, that you went on the show? Yeah, you know, um, I, I, you know, since it was the original year, the first year of the Golden Bachelor, the first season of it, I was slight, well, I'd say more than slightly worried because you never know. Bachelor Nation has always done these epic things. So the people on the dates do really cool things, but they're also kind of challenging for somebody my age, I would think. Some of them, some of these sporting events and some of the crazy things they had to, to do. I also didn't want to look foolish. I wanted to, I want to date with dignity. I want to be, and when you're in your 60s, you, you know, dignity is an important thing. And I didn't want to embarrass my kids. So I didn't want to do anything on national TV that would embarrass me or my kids. And I didn't know what Bachelor Nation had in store for us. I am so happy to report that everything that they did with us was um, appropriate for our ages, other than sleeping in bunk beds, which was hilarious. Um, But everything was very, very appropriate for our ages. And we were able to do it with dignity. And we had a blast. We had so, so, so much fun. But I did wonder, you know, now that the people that are, if they decide to do another season, the people that go on for the next season will probably have a lot less angst about it because they can see, you know, how it's all portrayed and, you know, the fun we had and the great connections we made with each other and that we were doing it in a dignified way. You feel like you've made uh, friends for life, even though your your stay was short? Yeah, I can't even tell you. Um, you know, you're kind of in an environment that um, you make friends very quickly because you live you do everything together and you're in this kind of alien situation. So you kind of cling on to each other a little bit, kind of for safety and for comfort. And you also, you're sleeping with them and you're eating with them and you're going on these fun adventures and um, everything is like amplified uh, because you're in this, this huge environment with these cameras everywhere with microphones on and they are encouraging you to talk. You know, you're not allowed to go and lay by the pool by yourself. You're not really encouraged to go upstairs in your room. They want you to stay down and be a part of the group. And so you have a lot of like really meaningful interaction with everybody else um, that you're there with. So you become very close. And not only that, we share like a, a weird bond that we're all in this part of life in our 60s and 70s and we're single and it's hard to find those people out in the wild so like when i'm at home i have very 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 few friends who are my age and single so to be in a house living with these people that understand your life and understand the things that you're going through um was you know it was like a great recipe for a really close friendship and that happened quickly and so first couple episodes you made a big impression early on uh, I remember the the talent competition. You didn't. You weren't singing. You weren't dancing. Oh no! You wouldn't what want to did, see that. What What did you do, Joan? So they uh, surprised us with the talent competition, which wasn't a huge surprise because it's something that they traditionally do on bachelor shows. I had crossed my fingers and just hoped and prayed that they wouldn't make us do one. And sure enough, Jesse came in with that date card, and it was a talent competition. And I have really no talent. I don't sing. I don't dance very well. I certainly, I don't do anything else that, you know, is good for stage. Um, So I was kind of wandering around the house. They gave us a few hours to prepare and could not figure out what to do. And I started talking to my producer, Shabby. And um, she was like, you got to figure something out. And she's like, what's your talent? And I was like, I I don't have one. I said, like, right now, I feel like I can walk from a limo um, across like a cobblestone driveway to a man that I'm really nervous about meeting without like falling. 
So like, you know, I have very, very small talents. And right now, like, that's about the best one I can do right now. And so we were laughing about the stupid things like I said I could do, you know, I can make a bagel without burning it in that toaster oven you have there and stupid stuff. And so she goes, why don't you do a comedy routine? And I go, well, because I'm not that funny. And I said, but you know, I can write a funny poem, which is really weird. I've been doing it for years. I do it for like my kids' birthdays and stupid occasions. And so I said, I can write a funny poem. She goes, go write the funny poem. So I did it. I like banged it out in like five minutes because it's just one of the things I could do. I didn't think anybody would be interested in hearing my stupid poem. And, you know, I got up there with great trepidation, but I made all of the other women from my season promise they would laugh. So I got up there with a little bit of confidence because I knew I would at least get some laughs from, um, you know, the lady sitting in the audience with me. So I got up there and I did it and it was hilarious. It wasn't funny, but it, you know, I got me through the, got me through the, the, well, uh, the show. That, that stupid poem, as you call it, uh, definitely made an impression and it stood out because all the others were doing the traditional things and you were doing the very non-traditional thing. And it really worked clearly, not just for the viewers, but for, for Gary, clearly. Yeah. Yeah, luck, really luckily, because um, there were certainly people there that had better talents. I mean, Faith is a great singer, and Leslie is an amazing dancer, and, you know, people had really kind of fun, funny things that they were doing. We had some comedians that, like, literally could be on stage. In fact, Jesse Palmer came up um, kind of at one of the breaks, and he goes, this is the best talent competition I've ever seen. He goes, you guys are hilarious. He goes, this should be, he goes, I hope they um, uh, air every single bit of, every single one of your bits. Um, so, but I got lucky and I had expressed to Gary how nervous I was about, uh, being on stage and how I have stage fright. So I, I, I somewhat feel like he maybe took a little pity on me. Um, and that I did. Okay. I did good enough that it didn't look bizarre that he picked me, I, I guess. And there was definitely a connection, at least watching on TV. I mean, you can tell, you know, when you're at a movie or a TV show, and in this case, a reality show there was definitely a connection uh that was that was real at least from from my point of view what about from your point of view absolutely so um we had you know been shooting for several days before we got to the talent competition thing and over those days i had gotten just really short snippets of time with gary but we had had you know some really good talks but you know three and five you know between three and five minutes each time so very 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 quick so like we were due to have like a good conversation. So I needed a date to see if like this was good for me and this was good for him. And, um, you know, this, I didn't have one of those epic dates. I didn't go like on a yacht and I didn't go in a hot air balloon and I didn't go ATVing. I had just like a regular date where you go and you sit down at a table and you have dinner and you talk for a couple hours. And that's exactly what we needed. And we talked about like, what do you do on a Saturday morning? Because we had kind of already gotten through the epic things that you need to talk about, like about the loss of a spouse and about, you know, where would we live if we ended up together, him being from Indiana and uh, myself being from Maryland. And we'd had these kind of big talks. We hadn't had the talks like the daily boring life talks, like what do you do on a Saturday? So we had those talks and it just seemed like we matched up in so many, like it kind of in everything we talked about, we matched up. We like what we do, like that we both have a dog and that we like to cook and we like to watch football on the weekends and we love being with our families and maybe things that a lot of people would have matched up, but happened to be we did. And we also, I mean, obviously had an attraction. So it ended up being a really phenomenal date. I have to tell you, I walked out of there and I felt for the first time that I could see my life with somebody else, just from that little snippet of being with him. And you know, it's also comforting to go on a date with somebody that you know is looking for the same things. So he's looking for somebody to spend his life with. And so, uh, so was I. So you're not guessing, you know, wondering if this date is, you know, if you're on the same wavelength when you're dating. So it's a reality show, which some people don't think is real life, but then real life happened and you got a call or you got a text from your daughter and what ha happened then? Yeah. So actually the next morning, so I had this great date. I went home, I'm laying in my top bunk and I was just hoping that one of the girls would be awake when I got home and nobody was. And I was rehashing that date in my, in my head. And I was like, God, that was like so amazing. That was really, really good. And um, I was so happy when I woke up in the morning. I walked downstairs and I was talking to the ladies. We we're all getting our coffee. And uh, one of the producer comes up, comes up to me and she says, uh, can you come over here? I have, a, um, I have something I need to show you. And she shows, shows me the text from my daughter. We go sit down on a sofa and she shows me the text from my daughter. And um, she had had a baby eight days before I, we, I had left. And at this point, it's about been about 15 days. And 
she is just in the depths of this postpartum depression and it has hit her hard and she and her husband are trying to navigate it and they are just not able to, they're having a terrible time and they're trying to find her help, psychiatrist, meds, something. The mental health system is just so hard to navigate. Neither one of them can do it. And she's like, I need you. I need you to come home. And I was like, I said to the producer, I said, I, I need to leave right now. I said, I, I need a flight out of here. And so they did it. Bachelor Nation said, of course you do. They are all about family. And they said, we'll start making the arrangements right now. And we did. Um, but I did, you know, I had a little work to do. I had to go say goodbye to all my friends and I had to say goodbye to Gary. You know, he, I owed him that, you know, he gave me this wonderful date. He could have picked any of those women there and he picked me and I felt kind of guilty that maybe I had taken away from somebody else, you know, some of the time that he could have spent exploring a relationship because when you leave the bachelor, you leave for good. You know, it's not like a regular, you know, if you're dating a person in, you know, real life and you say, Hey, you know, I got to take a week off and, you know, from us and, take care of my family and I'll give you a call when things are settled down. That's not how it works. When you leave, you're done. You don't, you don't get another chance. So it was hard leaving. So was there any chance? Well, first let's talk about how emotional that was for you. Well, like I said, I was like on this high when I came down in the morning and I got this text and I went from, you know, she said, you know, we're, we'll start working on the arrangements to get you home. And I went upstairs to my room to pack and it like hit me then that this was so final and I'll never, never, ever know like what could have happened or what could be between the two of us. You know, this was done, it was over. Um, and like, I had this journey that was halted and you don't ever get to, you know, to figure out what would have happened. So I was really, really sad. And when they said I had to go tell him, um, and I knew I owed that to him, but he was coming to the house to take Ellen out on a date. And so I didn't want to damper his spirits, dampen his spirits with that. But I, you know, I did have to, I owed it to him to talk to him about it and tell him how sorry I was. And, you know, he was just as I expected he would be amazing. He, um, I met him at his car when he got there and we went and sat down and I explained to him what had happened. And he said, you know, you're, he said, you're breaking my heart. He said, I got up this morning and I was dancing in my hotel room. I was so excited about our date. I felt like things were really, really, you know, headed in a positive direction with the two of us. He said, but I would do the same thing that you're doing. He said, we have the same moral compass. He goes, and you're doing what you need to do for your family and you're doing what's right, which then kind of broke my heart even more because he was this upstanding good guy that I thought he was. And now I know he is. And it just, you know, made it a little worse, honestly, not better. Yeah. Um, was there, so you said it's final. So was there no chance besides the final two episodes, which I guess everybody comes back for, there was no chance you were going to come back? So there is a chance sometimes that people come back and you've seen that on other bachelor seasons yeah. and they actually asked me if I would come back and I actually tried to come back. So, um, I still needed to get things straightened out with my daughter and there wasn't a big amount of time for yeah. that to happen because, very soon, this ours was a quick season. Ours was only 30 days or, you know, just the month of August. So um, the next week, hometown visits were going to start. So I had like one week to get back and get back in the swing of things and see if that, you know, he can only pick a few women to do the hometown visits, three or four generally. So um, I needed to get back quickly and I just couldn't get things done quick enough to get back in that small time frame. I would only been home like five days if I had gone back on the Monday you know, no doctors are working over the weekends. It just, the timing was just yeah. super lousy as much as I wanted to. And, and I really did try and Bachelor Nation tried to do it for me. They found flights for me and all that. I just had a daughter who still needed me. I, I couldn't leave yet. Yeah. So uh, the most important question, your daughter and uh, grandbaby, are, everybody's okay? Phenomenal. Everybody's great. A little meds, a little um, therapy and a great baby and a wonderful husband and the three of them are this they're a perfect little family right now they have a happy baby who loves to smile and they are loving being parents now um, the beginning was hard a rough beginning but it couldn't be better now honestly so when you look back and I know you've been asked a million times look back at the decision I know you said it, it was it was there was no decision right there, there was no decision. Well, honestly, up until I was a little worried about my daughter. She ended up having a C-section. So there was a little, there were a few days there that I thought, I'm not sure if I can leave her yet. So there was a little 
um, decision making, but it had nothing to do with bachelor nation at that point. Once I had decided I was going to go, I was going to go. I did kind of step back and look at like what it would, you know, if I, if this was really realistic, but I wanted to go so badly, I can't tell you. I do feel like Bachelor Nation has some really good success stories. And even if I did not end up being the one, which, you know, 21 out of the 22 of us weren't going to be the one, um, I just thought it would be a great way for me to kind of open my heart. And the bonus was I went there to find love and I got so much more. I got all these great friends who now I can share this dating journey with and we can laugh about funny dates and we can talk about you know the right way to find a person and we can do it together because it's a lot more fun to do together than it is alone would you do it again i would i would do it in a second i know what to expect now i would do it probably a lot more comfortably and you do go over in your mind things that you think oh gosh i wish i had done that a little differently all of us have had this conversation with each other um i'm really close to christina in the house and she is just tortured that she wished she had said some things that maybe would have helped her stay along around longer you know i have some things that i may have done differently in my head so if given the chance to do it again i certainly would so you you talked about it a little bit earlier but to me, the, the biggest thing for this show is showing people that love over the age of 60, first of all, it happens, it's common, it's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you agree with that assessment that that should be the biggest takeaway for people who think of only, you know, perfect 25-year-olds uh, dating each other, that that's not, that's not the only kind of love out there? Yeah, I think that... Um... People expect 25 and, you know, 20 and 30 year olds and even 40 year olds to, um, you know, if you're single and you're 25 and 30 and 40, people are like, well, what's wrong? Or, you know, are you dating? Are you going to get married? You know, what's going on? But when you're in your 60s and 70s, nobody's saying that to you. They're all like, God, if you kiss somebody on TV and when you're in your 60s, and 70s, people are covering their eyes and they're embarrassed by the whole thing. So I think that maybe we made it less embarrassing. Yeah. that we showed that you can be in your 60s and 70s and you can be really fun. You can be, um, you know, you, you can keep yourself well and look good and still have a chance at finding love. And it's not embarrassing and you shouldn't close your eyes when like, you know, when I kiss Gary, don't close your eyes. It's not gross. I mean, we're, you know, we're people that are looking for love. We want companionship. We want to go through life with somebody and that shouldn't be like some that shouldn't be cringeworthy. Getting rid of taboos that shouldn't be taboos in the first place. Yeah, um, I agree. Do you think, and maybe you've been asked this particular question, and I don't know if it's a fair question, but do you think you would have uh, married Gary had things been different? So hard to tell. Um, you know, I went on the show knowing kind of who he was because he was in, introduced on Good Morning America. So like, I had a, a good idea about his background. So I knew that we matched up in a lot of important ways that he loved his family and that he had been a widow, which, you know, wasn't a criteria for me that I date somebody who had had like a horrible, terrible thing that happened to him, like losing a spouse. But it certainly um, it makes it makes it a little easier because you understand each other. These things that have kind of defined you for a little while that you don't want to define you you want to move on and find somebody else and but they you know they are part of you once it's happened and so he made me feel very comfortable that he understood you know my journey I kind of understood his and then we had these other things that were really good like our families and you know our interest and so um you know I I saw it certainly moving in a direction that um could have ended up with me being the final person to receive the final rose and having a long-term relationship, but it was so hard to tell because I left so early on. We had one great date. I certainly think that would have, um, I, I believe that I may, I would have gotten maybe a hometown visit and he would have met my family and that would have been really important to see how they felt about him. But I, I feel like I could have ended up being the person, but you know, we'll never yeah. know. And I love, love, love Teresa. And I think he ended up with a phenomenal person. So this iteration of the franchise, The Golden Bachelor, was a huge hit, a huge success. So there are rumors, and I don't know why there wouldn't be, I don't know why there wouldn't be a Golden Bachelorette, um, and I don't know what you can t say or not say, but um, that would seem almost a no-brainer that if you're going to have a Golden Bachelor and it's a big hit, that there would be a go Golden Bachelorette. Is that a crazy thought? Probably not, right? So I, I don't think it's a crazy thought, but they tell us Absolutely nothing. So they, um, Bachelor Nation is very um, smart with what they do and how they do things. And I think that they are very careful 
that we they have a great momentum right now with the batch with the golden bachelor and they don't want to um waste that opportunity so they are going to be very careful about what they do next and they have told us absolutely nothing we are all wondering um i think every if you asked any single person on this season if they wanted to be the golden bachelorette they would say yes i think that they're in my mind to be honest i wonder we were when you put a bunch of girls or women into a room and you say talk we talk and we have a lot to say i'm afraid if you do that with a typical man in the 60s and 70s you say talk they're probably going to talk about sports they're probably not going to talk about relationships I'm, I'm, there's a part of me that thinks maybe it won't be as hugely successful with a group of men as it is with a group of women. I would love to say that I'm wrong about that because I would love to be the golden bachelorette and walk into a room and having, you know, have 22 eligible men, like kind of served up on a plate for me because boy, like bachelor nation does all the hard work for you. They vet everybody and they make sure that you be a decent match. And then you get to go explore all those. So like a lot of the homework is done for you. You don't have to go through all of those you know, many dates to make sure you should even be exploring something long-term. They've kind of do all that work for you. So um, I would love for it to work. I, I Bachelor Nation knows what they're doing. I, if they say go, I'm sure that they have a plan and it will be good. You, you answered my next question. If hypothetically, just between you and I, Joan, if someone mm -hmm. asks you, uh, let's say they announce they're going to do the Golden Bachelorette and they ask Joan Vassos to be that person, that Golden Bachelorette, what would you say? So I think number one, Gary is a really hard act to follow. He was um, he was perfect. He could stand up in front of everybody and give a heartfelt speech without even thinking about it because it came from his heart. He was vulnerable. He was um, he made everybody feel very special. So he was really, really, really good at this. So I think whoever they pick to be the Golden Bachelorette, if they pick anybody to be a Golden Bachelorette, I think they have to be as open and as vulnerable and um and as smart i mean gary's a smart guy it's not easy to stand up with, in front of a, a bunch of strangers and give speeches which he had to do all the time he had to he was on the you know on the spur of the moment all the time he had to give a speech so um i would love the opportunity um i think i could fill his shoes somewhat i think he you know he created a hard road map to follow he, he has big shoes um, to fill. I would, I think I, I think I could rise to the occasion and I would like the opportunity, but I think there's also many, many, many women from my season who would be great at it also. I think you could fill the shoes very well, personally. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Um, Joan, is there anything that you haven't been asked? You know, probably a lot of people ask you the same kinds of questions that I probably asked you. Anything that you haven't been asked that you wish you had been asked that, that, or that you'd like to share about the experience or anything, really? Hmm. Um, I'll tell you, like, the thought that goes through my mind still is, um, and I, I don't know if you remember the one part of the episode where I was kind of the bigger part of the episode. As I was leaving the mansion, I said in the limo, I said, as you get older, you start to feel invisible. And yes. a lot that, that resonated with a lot of people. And I would love it if um, somehow that became a little bit more of a social movement because I got so many messages from people. I'm like talking like thousands. And I answered all of them that said, I am so glad you said that. I've been trying to put that into words for years. I feel invisible. And I would love it if somehow we were able to take this momentum that we have from the show and people watching it and people relating to our journeys and make it so it does something good. And I have no idea how to do that, um, but I really wish that that was a possibility. I did see that and I did think that was amazing what you said. I thought it was profound and I, I, I'm glad that people responded. And I think that's a, a really great thing that you that you were able to to kind of encapsulate in, in uh, a couple of words. So. I thought that was uh, that was really, really good. Um, Joan, I really want to thank you for for talking to us today. Um, I, we we all enjoyed watching your journey and, and wish you the, the best of luck and really amazed by how many people you've inspired you and the other contestants, but you specifically, how many people you've inspired for a, a second chance at love. I think that's really important for folks that are, you know, 60 and over. So yeah. best of luck. 
and uh, you have an open invitation to come back anytime. Thank you so much, Joe. It was great reconnecting with you after all these years. And thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. And thanks everybody for watching and listening. And we'll see you next time on MoCo's Most Famous. Have a great day, everybody.